صلو علی النبی صلو علی النبی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد واله الطيبين الطاهرين واصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته عيد مبارك in this day be one of utmost joy and peace from deep within the hearts but as we greet each other and wish each other the greetings of Eid our families have been massacred and they have been butchered they have been hungry and they have been thirsty such a day does not bring joy to our hearts if anything it brings a lot of grief and reminder that the Muslim community is not where it ought to be. It is nowhere near where it is supposed to be. A community reaching 2 billion, 1.67 billion with this state is a state of crisis and an embarrassment. So it brings a lot of grief to our heart. But with acknowledgement of inability and embarrassment before God and embarrassment before our brothers and sisters, who are being butchered and who have been butchered mercilessly and their killers have proudly posted the pictures of killing them without any sense of consequence and with full impunity. All we can do is to pray Fatiha and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to straighten our affairs. With that, let us pray Fatiha for the poor souls that have lost their lives and may we pain and never cease to pain at the deaths of our mothers, our daughters, and our little children whose lives have been brutally snatched away from them. May this pain be some penance for us and our inactivity. Al-Fatiha. I'm not one for advocating distress or warfare or killing. I'm not one who distinguishes between a Muslim and a non-Muslim, between a faithful and a non-faithful, but taking birth in the house of Islam. It makes it my first responsibility to care for my own family, even though humanity is my family. But when one segment of humanity is being oppressed so brutally and nobody else is talking about it, it causes a lot of pain. And then the fear of standing before these little children on the day of Qiyamah. When they will look and say, you had nothing to lose. You could have supported us. You could have spoken about us and you failed to do that. And then after that, to meet with the Blessed Prophet and be questioned by the Blessed Prophet. And after that, to meet with the Majestic One. It's not an easy prospect. What we are doing right now as the Muslim Ummah in a human community is not good. It is bad. It is vicious and evil. It is totally unacceptable. This is not the way a human community should be. And especially not the way the Muslims should be. It's a shame that we have regressed from the pedestal at which the Prophet had left us. It is wrong, and there is dire lack of leadership within the Muslim community. Either we are afraid 
or we are politically motivated, or we gauge by what the world will react opposed, as opposed to our actions. On the one hand, we say Allah Razak, He is the feeder. On the other hand, we say, if we say anything against the world powers right now, then we'll be sanctioned. Look at the way we are thinking. Something has gone very wrong. When it comes to the Palestinians, some states speak. When it comes to China, those very states remain silent. When it comes to China, certain states speak against China. When it comes to Palestine, then they remain silent. Look at the way in which we are thinking. There is wrong in this. And it's a total lack of leadership, spiritual leadership. We do not need leadership that takes us into war. We need leadership that has foresight and wisdom. That can bring about peace. That knows its worth and the worth of the 1.7 billion Muslims. That can also win the sympathies of humanity at large. And we are seeing this. Humanity at large is a good thing. They are good people. Majority of the people of this earth are good. They are endowed with the light of God. They can't tolerate this. And they can't tolerate the inactivity of the Muslim states and the support of the non-Muslim states for the barbaric actions of the Israelis who are killing innocent, defenseless people. Now I know my words might not sit well with you. I don't blame you. And I know we've been frightened into not talking and silenced. But trust me, nobody can harm anybody because we are not enemies of people. We are the lovers of people. We are not talking against anybody. We are talking for the oppressed people. And that is the ethos of humanity. This is what every individual is supposed to do. In fact, the non-Muslims are doing this far more than the Muslims are. There is a way to be critical, which is measured. And for us to then not even do that shows what a pathetic state we are in. Our ulama, our leaders, our community heads should talk about these things. People of faith should talk about it, not remain silent, but not inciting hatred, not at all. Now I have to, as per the instruction of the Prophet, in the first khutbah, remind ourselves of the essence of our stay on earth and what we are supposed to do. There comes a point in life, obviously at this stage, when you reach at this stage in life, when life has gone, you begin to realize that the only thing that was worthwhile in this world and the only task at hand was to be grounded with God, to find God and to make peace with God internally. When you're young, you're aspiring, you want to change the community, you want to speak the truth. As you age, you begin to see that no, no, it's very different. It's all about finding your inner self. It's all about connecting deeply with God. This condition in which we are right now is not good. There is a lot of disturbance and turbulence in there. This heart is not at ease. There is anger in there. There is greed in there. There is jealousy in there. There is lack of trust of God in there. There is wastefulness in the mind. This is not where I am supposed to be. My journey is about to come to an end. I need to find myself. I need to find my God. I need to make peace. I need to go with a happy heart. I need to leave this place wholesomely. I need to forgive all and need to be forgiven by all. I need to say to God as I breathe my last, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, most of which I have wasted. Forgive me for the rest, for you are the most forgiving. We need to work inwardly, inwardly. We need to cleanse that soul of ours, as both of the surahs today informed us. Successful are those who purify their souls. Purification of the soul is not what we have been taught. Eat less and drink less and sleep less. 
no wonder people get admitted to psychiatric hospitals after that. Not eating, not drinking, and not sleeping, what do you expect? That's not purity of the heart. Eat as much as you want. Who has prevented you from partaking in the bounties of God? That's what the Quran says. Sleep, you're human beings, you need to sleep. What this verse means is purify the inner soul. Rejoice with the kingdom of Solomon, but share at the same time. Do not become greedy and so attached that you can't live without wealth. Acquire wealth, enjoy wealth, thank God and share with others. Rejoice in the bounties that God has given you. That's what it means. But remove jealousy from within. Remove greed from within. But remove attachment from within. Purify that side in there. Remove distrust from God. Trust in Allah. If sickness comes upon us, then thank Him. If He tests us with poverty, then thank Him. If He tests us with enemies, then thank Him because those enemies come as gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are there to awaken our inadequacies from within. So the first thing is gain and loss in both states. Thank Allah. Constantly be vigilant of the soul. Know that on many occasions, our words are righteous, but the inner being feels wrong about them. That is wrong because the intention accompanying those right words was a corrupted intention. Become mindful of that. Become vigilant. And say to Allah, help me. And get rid of this state from within me. Become like transparent water that is pure. Let there be no tarnished, let there be no admixture in there that tarnishes it. Let us remove hypocrisy, greed, fear, anxiety. It doesn't make sense at this stage when death looms over my head that I feel other, that I fear other than God. Has he not taken care of me for all these years of my life? If my tomorrow comes, shall he abandon me? Why do I need to fear people? Why? But do I need to be foolish as well to tell people, to incite them into hatred? No. But fear should go. There should be no fear left. There comes a stage in which there should be no insecurity left within the heart. There comes a stage where there should be no ex expectations left within the heart. That is how the hearts are purified. And that is how we find our God. We cannot boast. We cannot be pretentious at this age now. Gone are those days now. The childishness has finished. No insecurity, no hatred, no boasting. Become pure people from within. Find our God. And be at peace with our God. Thank Allah for every sajda he allows us to perform. Subhanallah. Honestly, now I see at this stage in my life that the best thing, the greatest favor Allah has had upon us is that he has obligated us with prayers. Five times a day, pray. So that at least there is some connection left between us and our truth. Otherwise, we would have forgotten our truth altogether. Thank God for the fasts. Although I do not wish for there to be more than 30 fasts because I can't hack them. <laughs> but thank God for the 30 fasts. Thank God for zakat and khums. Thank God Allah has obliged us with all these obligations. So at least there's a little bit of a reminder in there to reclaim our truth and to bring our light to its fullest. How foolish are we? And I've tested this out. I've really tested this out. Whenever you do not desire wealth and you begin to give wealth, God sends more. I don't know, Bhai or somebody sent me this, Sajjad Bhai. That's just phenomenal, phenomenal anecdote. God had bestowed excessively upon somebody. And Moses met with him. He said to Moses, are you going to talk with God? He said, yes. He said, tell God, please don't give me any more. He said, he's given me so much, so much that I feel embarrassed. Ask God not to give me any more. Moses said, fine. He passed by another person and said, Moses, are you going to speak with 
obviously God, I mean, nowadays you will say with the boss or whatever. Moses said, yes. He said, can you tell him to give me something? I've only got this one garment. I've got nothing else. And Moses said, fine. Moses went and spoke with God. He said, God, but uh, there are two people I've met. One is saying, Allah, you have given me more than enough. I can't thank you for it. Do not burden me with more bounties. Another one is saying, God, you haven't given me anything. Apart from one garment, can you give me more? God replied to Moses. He said, tell the first one. If he wants me to stop bestowing upon him, then he should stop thanking me. Every time I give him something, he thanks me. And therefore I multiply my blessings upon him. He said, says to the second one, that if he wants me to grant him more, then to start thanking me. If he thanks me, I will give him more. I mean, there's something in there for us to understand. There is something in there for us to understand. If we give in the way of humanity, he will give more. He is saying that. Why this insecurity about wealth? If he appreciates us, who cares? If the whole of humanity spits on our faces, who cares? This is the very humanity who spits on our faces today, who will cry for us and pray fatia for us when we are put inside our graves. This humanity is a foolish place. Don't live with the appreciation for, of these humans. Who cares about these humans? What have they done? Look at them. I'm talking about my own self. Why fight for their appreciation? Who cares? The appreciation, the one whose appreciation matters is Allah. What has he lost? The one who has found you, says Hussein. Work towards Allah. Find Allah. If he finds me beautiful in this ugly state, then I am beautiful. If he finds me ugly in the worldly beautiful state, then I am ugly. It is all to do with us and with him. Remove these prejudices and discriminations from our hearts. There is no black, there is no white, there is no sick, there is no poor, there is no old, there is no ugly, there is no beautiful. There is no Muslim, there is no non-Muslim. Remove all of this filth from our hearts. It is only Allah and the beauty of Allah that prevails. The other thing that I want to say now is before the second khutbah, and now you must be wondering, oh no, there's a second khutbah coming after this. That we are here not only to find our own selves and make our peace with God, but we are also here to do our bit in this world. Have you imagined that we have created you in vain? No. That you will not be returned to us. We have to perform our part of work here. Humanity is one family. We need to contribute. What, uh, in whatever way Allah gives us capacity, contribute. If we can do good to humanity by studying, and taking steps forward to improve the status of humanity, then that is a service owed. If Allah has given us the ability to speak, then spread the goodness of God and humanity. If God has given us wealth, then share it with humanity. In whatever capacity God keeps us, in whatever capacity God gives us, we are supposed to share and make this humanity somewhat better than what it is at present. Even if that means picking up the telephone and asking our near ones if they are well. Even if it means to going to our neighbors and asking after them. Even if it means to hold the hand of a person and crossing road and helping them to cross a road. Then do it. Whatever is our capacity, we need to contribute in that capacity. And if somebody has nothing else to give, then forgive the enemy from within. And if somebody has no enemy to forgive, then pray for humanity from within. We all have a responsibility towards humanity. Humanity is our family. With that then, let us pray one more Fatiha for our dear family in 
Palestine and for all our Marhumin Al Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-asr inna l-insana lafi khus ila al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasu bil-haq wa tawasu bil-sab Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Very quickly, and I'm sorry I've taken a long time in the first sermon. So I've been listening to, obviously through social media, to renowned people. Now there's a very articulate and popular Hindu doctor who has his own show and his own followers. He made this comment and he said, the dividing line in our present world is Zionism. When it comes to the Palestinian issue, there is no neutrality. You're either right or you're wrong. And he said, Zionism marks that dividing line between right and wrong. If you're a Zionist, you're wrong. And the way he defined Zionism was lack of care, lack of empathy. Justification of whatever we do in terms of transgression against the other. Either actively or by supporting those who are actively engaged in oppressing others. Or by that, not taking sides and being neutral. He said, that is the attitude of Zionism at present. And that is the dividing line that has divided humanity in its entirety. And we can clearly see this. It has divided humanity. Because of social media and because the world at large can see what is happening. There is nobody on the face of this earth who doesn't understand the brutality of the Israeli actions against the Palestinians. And there is no one in this world whose heart is either paining or not paining. There is no middle ground left anymore. And I, was, I thought that was intriguing and amazing because in history, this seldom happens. According to the Quran, it happened in the time of Nabi Nu, that the world was either right or wrong. Never again has it happened in history at such a large global scale. During the Second World War, obviously, a lot of the people did not know what was happening. But right now, the world at large knows what is happening. There are two sides. And then he said, you don't have to be born into Judaism to be a Zionist. He said, there are 70 million Christian Zionists, not only ideologically, who want to bring in the coming of the Messiah within Jerusalem. He said, Christian Zionists are all those who do not sympathize and who feel no empathy with the suffering of the people who are being brutally butchered and they are still funding the state of Israel to go, uh, go ahead with its campaign in building their greater state. Then he said, there are Hindu Zionists. He was speaking very fearlessly. The people who support the state of Israel and who share that notion. He said there are Muslim Zionists. But the thing that was very important, what he said was that the root of Zionism is this notion of being the chosen ones and favored ones of God where you can do and commit all brutalities and God will overlook it and condone it. That is when I thought that my goodness, majority of us are Zionists. Think about this sickness that we have in us. We feel we are the chosen ones, don't we? I mean, I don't know about the younger generation, but we, the older generations, we've always felt we are the chosen ones. As Muslims, we are the chosen ones. And then if it wasn't enough for us to be Muslims and the chosen ones, guess what we did? We divided Muslims into 73 sects and we said, our sect is the chosen one. The rest of you are going to hell. This is the root of Zionism, according to him. This notion of the privileged ones. And then if Shiaism wasn't enough, then we have Sayyid and non-Sayyid, in which Sayyid are more preferred than the non-Sayyid. 
Look at this sickening attitude that we have. The Brahmins feel they are the chosen ones. The Jews feel they are the chosen ones. The Christian feels they are the chosen ones. And within the 75, 76, or whatever the denominations of Christians that you have, each one feels they are the chosen ones. Within Muslims, each one feels they are the chosen ones. And within those chosen ones, there are subsects who feel they are the chosen ones. This is the real sickness within us. When we feel we are the chosen ones and we are eligible, then we can justify some level of transgression against the other. Then we will justify it, even if it be economical transgression, that I deserve more than you do because I'm a Sayyid. That's a level of oppression against another. Think about what I am saying. Think about what this man has said. So Zionism, at the very root, is this sense of being privileged. Now those people who are committing those atrocities feel extremely privileged. The rest of us, thank God, do not feel privileged to that level. But nonetheless, the root of Zionism is in all of us. That sickness is in all of us. May God put it out totally. Then there is another very famous journalist. And she said that she lived amongst the Palestinians for a month. She said, I never found them speaking ill of the Israelis or wanting the destruction of the Israelis. She said, then I went to the Tolerance Square in Israel. And she said, Israelis, all of them, majority of them were against the Palestinians. And I could see the hatred was palpable. You could feel it. She said, now that the Israelis are demonstrating, they're coming to the streets. It's not because they are against the war. They are against Netanyahu. But they are supporting the war against the Palestinians. It is not because they want the reduction of force and the brutality against the Palestinians. They only want the government to change so their, their hostages can be brought back. But as far as the Palestinians are concerned, they don't care less. Now, this is an American journalist saying this. I think Abby Martin or someone. Go and look at her, what she is saying. And they're quite fearless, these journalists are. God bless them for speaking the truth. No matter what the consequence, they will speak. Nobody is against people speaking in a measured manner with facts. Don't get emotional and don't let your emotions take you away from the path of justice. Be just and speak. This is what humanity needs, justice and truth and honesty. Now, the majority of the Israeli nation being in that way is worrying and concerning. It is not good. I am not saying I advocate the hatred of the Israelis. No, I'm saying this is a part of our humanity. Until that part is rectified, the rest of humanity is tarnished. And the rectification is not through destruction and killing and hatred. Nobody hates the Jews. We are not anti-Semite. But I'm saying don't even hate the Zionists who are advocating for the murders and the cleansing of the Palestinians. Don't even hate them. We need to, we are concerned. But we need to find a way into how to resolve this problem. They are deeply paranoid. They are extremely paranoid, these people. And I can sympathize with this paranoia because the Shias are paranoid. Now forgive me for saying this. All the duas that the Shias read, we are few in numbers and we've got so many enemies. Who's your enemy? You can go and become the prime minister of this country. Who's, your, who's stopping you? You know all these duas that we read? And telling the 12th Imam, where are you? We are dying. Who's killing you? You're in a good position. These duas are very negative. It's an outcome of paranoia. It might have been valid at some point, but now they're totally invalid, those captions of these duas, and they've not been given by the Imam. So I can sympathize with those people and their paranoia. I remember in my earlier days, I was paranoid as well. Everybody is my enemy. Everybody is against me. To the extent that Muhammad Bhai, we nearly mounted a revolution in our own mosque. Do you remember? In the support of Baba Khomeini. When everybody else was supporting Ayatollah Khoi, we, the youth, we held the whole community to ransom. <laughs> I don't know how many of you can remember this. 
We are paranoid people like they are. So we can understand and relate. We need to overcome this. Now, Sunak will still not stop arms sales to Israel. Seven of our, sorry, three of our citizens have been killed, right? Three or four. It has caused outrage and quite rightly. But I'm asking Sunak, 15 to 20,000 women and children did not cause this outrage in your soul? Sunak is the biggest Zionist. And Starmer is no less of a Zionist. Look at the way they are supporting. 80% of the British public is against this war. We are appalled at Sunak and Starmer, but still shamelessly these people are supporting them. Shamelessly. It's a disgrace to our nation that these people are leading us. Use our vote to bring somebody else in who can represent us properly. The only thing Sunak can say when Galloway won was that the protests are a sign of Islamic extremism. Killing 40,000 people is not extreme, but peacefully protesting with Muslims, Christians, Jews, people of no faith and all faiths is extremism. Where are their minds? What has possessed these people? What has deprived their souls of humanity? What level of hypocrisy is this? And even after our own citizens have been killed, they are still selling arms. Do you know something? We were selling arms to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis, without discrimination, were killing Yemeni civilians. The court ruled it as illegal for us to sell arms to the Saudis. Do you know this? I remember here I was screaming and shouting that Cameron is selling weapons to the Saudis, which they are not using, with care, until it went to the court. We will be taken to the court again. It will be such an embarrassment that we have sold arms to a regime that has killed little children. ICJ is saying that there's a plausible case for genocide that makes us complicit in genocide and crimes, but our government will not listen. And this is a state of democracy where 80% of the people are appalled by what Israel is doing, but people on the top are forcing the whole nation into support of barbaric actions. This is democracy when it goes wrong. When the next election comes, make sure Sunak is out. At least he doesn't have our vote. And Starmer doesn't have our vote. And I know it's not right for me to become political at this stage. But we can't support these monsters. They are the two most pathetic people I've ever seen. No less pathetic than Blair. Cameron took us to Libya. What did we gain? We've ruined Libya. We caused the death of a million people in Iraq. We are causing deaths of little children in our name. They have been the most pathetic parties, both of them conservative and labor for the last 20 to 24 years. Undeniably. And this cannot happen in our name. And the British public has awoken. And I hope we send a message to our politicians that no. We have nothing to do with your personal beliefs. You can be a Zionist, you can be whatever you want. But you will not support murders of innocent people in our name. And that is a message we need to send peacefully and truthfully. I'm sorry for taking up your time today. I will pray the very small ziyara of Imam Hussein and then Haji Muhammad will recite some Quran for us as, as we close. But let us finish this sermon first. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabb al-Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammadin al-Mustafa. Wa ala aliin al-Murtaba. Wa ala Fatimah al-Zahra. 
وعلى الحسن المجتبى والحسين الشهيد بكربلاء وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي وحجة الله بن الحسن القائم المهد المنتظر اللهم عجل فرجا وسهل مخرجا واجعلنا من أنصاره وعوانه والمستشهدين بين يدي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله السمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام ولك السلام وإليك يعود السلام سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين السلام عليك وعلى جدك وابيك السلام عليك وعلى أمك وأخيك السلام عليك وعلى تسعة المعصومين من ذريتك وبنيك السلام علينا وعليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد أرقول الحاجي محمد كم ان رسائت قرآن فور اس بليس Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Shall I just recite a few minutes from Surah Al-Hadid? A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sabbaha lillahi ma fi s-samawati wal-ard. وهو العزيز الحكيم له ملك السماوات والأرض يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم هو الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش يعلم ما يلج في الأرض وما يخرج منها وما ينزل من السماء وما يعرج فيها وهو معكم أينما كنتم والله بما تعملون بصير له ملك السماوات والأرض وإلى الله ترجع الأمور يولج الليل في النهار ويولج النهار في الليل وهو عليم بذات الصدور آمنوا بالله ورسوله وأنفقوا مما جعلكم مستخلفين فيه فالذين آمنوا منكم وأنفقوا لهم أجر كبير وما لكم لا تؤمنون بالله والرسول يدعوكم لتؤمنوا بربكم وقد أخذ ميثاقكم إن كنتم مؤمنين هو الذي ينزل على عبده آيات بينات ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وإن الله بكم لرؤوف رحيم 
وما لكم الا تنفقوا في سبيل الله ولله ميراث السماوات والارض لا يستوي منكم من انفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل اولئك اعظم درجه من الذين انفقوا من قبل وقاتلوا وكلا وعد الله الحسنى والله بما تعملون خبير من ذا الذي يقرض الله قرضا حسنا فيضاعفه له وله اجر كريم يوم ترى المؤمنين والمؤمنات يسعى يسعى نورهم بين ايديهم وبايمانهم بشراكم بشراكم اليوم جنات تجري من تحتها الانهار خالدين فيها ذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات <تصفيق>